Good morning. Wherever you happen to be joining us from this morning, it's a delight to be with you for this live stream service from St. James Cathedral for June 28th. I'm Father Andrew MacDonald, Associate Priest of St. James Cathedral, and I'm delighted to be joined by Carol Casella, who will be offering today's reading and prayers, as well as Jamie Tuttle and David Simon, who will be uh, upholding the musical ministry for today. We're also grateful to Emil and Nicholas, who manage the technological end of these live stream services from week to week. As has been our custom over the past several weeks, we'll have an opportunity in the middle of the service during the offertory hymn for you to make your electronic offerings to support the ongoing ministry of the cathedral. Alternately, of course, you're invited also to make contributions to your own parish community, wherever you may be joining us from this morning, as we continue to strengthen the body of Christ in all places. The leaflet for today's service, in case you're looking for it, can be found through the main page on the St. James Cathedral website. Under Recent News, you'll see an item called Livestream Worship, and on that page you'll see a link to the virtual service leaflet for today. So hopefully you find that and follow along as you feel comfortable this morning. I wish you every blessing for the week ahead. Week ahead. I invite you now into a moment of prayer before we begin our service.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us through your Son that love fulfills the law. May we love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. And may we love our neighbor as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, may the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. The word of the Lord. I have sworn an oath to David my 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. From the Gospel of Matthew. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. With the news earlier this week that the City of Toronto has been given permission to start the process of reopening, many of us are breathing into our masks, of course, a sigh of relief. In particular, small business owners and employees, mom and pop shops, and those in the service and food industries, those among who have been hit the hardest economically by the closures and shutdowns, may start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. After thousands upon thousands of layoffs, thousands upon thousands of applications to government relief programs, 
Those businesses that are the backbone of our local neighborhoods are eager to take down the signs that say closed and replace them with signs that say, come on in, open, back in business, welcome. It's the barber whose welcome sign I'm the most eager to see because January 20th was the last time I had a haircut. Jesus says, even the hairs of your head are numbered, but I've got news for this mop of hair atop of my head. Now it's your days that are numbered. Welcome. Come on in. Open. Welcome. Welcome is the word at the center of today's gospel reading. The words that we hear this morning come as part of the wisdom and instruction that Jesus gives the disciples as they prepare to begin their work, not just as disciples, but as apostles, the ones that Jesus sends out into the world. It's here that we find that first call to the followers of Jesus to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. It's here where Jesus speaks quite plainly about what's at stake for them in doing this, about the risk of persecution and hostility they will face in that ministry. You will be dragged before governors and courts, he tells them, that they are being sent out like sheep into the midst of wolves, that they would be hated because of the name of Jesus, that in many places they go, they will not be welcome. So Jesus saves his final words in these in this chapter mostly of instructions, to talk about the significance of welcome in their ministry. Now, welcome is one of those words that that is worth spending some time thinking about. It's one of those words that's become ubiquitous in our daily speech, so we may not notice what it might imply sometimes. We're taught as young children to say, thank you and you're welcome. Good morning and welcome to all of you, I say so often when I take that step and greet everyone when we're gathered here in our congregation. It's a word of invitation. You're welcome to have seconds if you like. It's a word of obligation. You're welcome to remove your shoes when you come in. Sometimes it's used to reflect the grace or the mercy of an action, as in, the government's tax cut was a welcome announcement. When you start to think about it, There's a certain sense of ownership that comes with the word welcome. In fact, it seems that more often than not, welcoming comes from a position of power. To declare welcome, you assume you have the privilege and power to offer that welcome. I'm the host, so I can welcome you to a second plate of food or not. It's my house, so I can welcome you not to scuff up my floors with your boots. I had the thing you needed to ask for, so I can say, you're welcome. Now, maybe I'm overanalyzing the language a little bit. I do that because I'm a frustrated Latin student, after all. And I'd never want to say that we should stop using the word welcome, that we should stop being accommodating and exercise hospitality when we have the opportunity. But considering all this, when we think about the word welcome, it's then fascinating to hear the instructions that Jesus has for his disciples about welcome. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, he says, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. In their apostolic mission, it's worth noting that Jesus leaves the act of welcoming not on those first missioners, those first disciples, those first apostles, those first evangelists, but on the folks who they will meet. Those first apostles sent out to teach and to cure and to heal, and to raise. They're also the ones who are to look for welcome from others. They have power to cast out demons, to raise the dead, to liberate from oppression. But the power and privilege to welcome rests with those to whom they're sent in their ministry. Just to put this another way, listen to what Jesus doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say, Whoever you welcome, I will welcome. Jesus doesn't say, whoever you accept, I will accept. Jesus doesn't say, whoever you exclude, I will exclude. Jesus says, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, 
and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Jesus didn't send out the disciples to find people to fit a pre-existing mold and bring them in. When Jesus said to those first disciples, come with me and I will make you fish for people, he didn't mean just certain types and certain kinds of people. Rather, Jesus puts the work on us to be sure that the face and the hands and the feet that we present are those of the body of Christ and not just our own, not marked by our own biases, our own blindness, our own preference. Jesus' words remind us that the sincerity and the integrity of our ministry dwells with those who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to welcome God's grace into their lives not by how many people we welcome in, but how many we are welcomed by. Now, Scripture makes it easy to think that maybe sometimes Jesus did say, whoever you accept, all accept, and whoever you exclude, all exclude. Scripture makes it easy to think that our mission is one of Christian triumphalism. After all, the last words of Matthew's Gospel is to go out and make disciples of all nations. It's easy to think that Scripture lets us decide who's in and who's out. Later in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus will say, Whatever you bind on earth, I will bind in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We hear it in John's Gospel, too. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain them, they are retained. That's power. That's authority. But a wise person once said, Tyranny is best tempered by fear of assassination. So instead, Jesus makes it clear that if we try to erect barriers around God, we just end up walling ourselves in. As Christians, as disciples, as people walking as yet by faith, the fruit of our ministry is found in the way that others meet and welcome God's grace, and not how many we welcome. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. This past month has been full of opportunities to rethink the place of welcome in the practice of both our Christian lives and our civic lives. This past month has shown just how wrong welcome can go when more importance is put on welcoming rather than being welcomed. More and more is coming to light about the racial and the economic divisions that are at play with the COVID-19 pandemic. A quick look at recent research right in our own city of Toronto shows that underserved and marginalized neighborhoods are at significantly higher risk for the spread of infection, while affluent neighborhoods have seen much stronger containment. A community that can't ensure the health and well-being of all its members can't be a place of welcome for anyone. Racial tensions across the world have become inflamed because of three short words. I can't breathe. Three words that after far too long have rippled through the public conversation, not just about racism, not just about systemic injustice and inequality, but policing and mental health support and community services, and really asking a question, just who the structures of our society are really meant to welcome. This week, We'll all celebrate Canada Day, the 153rd anniversary of Confederation. And while Canada loves to enjoy its global reputation as a place of peace and prosperity and pleasantry, there remains in equal measure a history of settlers who sought to integrate the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, rather than to seek welcome from those for whom this land has always been home. Today we also mark as part of our celebration, the conclusion of Pride Month, and we keep in prayer the LGBTQS 2S plus community. And we do so, mindful of the hurt that the church for too long has caused people based on their gender, their sexuality, and their identity. And not just on issues related to marriage, but by ideas like conversion therapy, by debates about scripture and theologies that have dehumanized and excluded and left too many people unable to welcome God into their lives. Discrimination, 
preference and privilege, margins and mainstreaming. This is what happens when welcome is reserved by those who exercise power. Rather than the boundlessness of God's grace, welcome becomes the carrot and the stick is conformity. Which is why it's good to hear again what Jesus says, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. As Christians, Jesus doesn't call us to create a space where we open the doors and deign to let people in. Rather, we're sent out into other people's spaces, armed only with the hope that the world will welcome us. Whether we're the oppressed or the oppressor, we're called, like the apostles, to use the gifts with which God has equipped us to teach, to cure, to raise, and to heal others even as we continue to be healed. To let God's grace work through us rather than to dole out our own welcome. And above all, through all this, we're called to remember who it is that welcomes us who it is that made us and calls us to be one together. And so in all these things we pray today, that the Holy Spirit might surround us all with God's grace and welcome us together as one. To heal those of us who need to be healed of our wounds and offenses. To raise those of us who need to be raised from despair and oppression to cleanse the structures of our world of injustice, inequality, and systemic neglect of the most vulnerable, and to cure those of us who need to be cured of our hatred and prejudice. And then, to send us out as God's people into the world, not just to welcome, but to be welcomed by others. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our faith as we say. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead in the life of the world to come. Amen. Give unto the Lord the honor due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts.
All things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Our bidding today will be Almighty God in your mercy. And the response will be, hear our prayer. Steadfast God, in these days when we so often feel exiled from life as we have known it, when we are impatient for a return to all that we remember as vivid and free, you remind us that it is peace realized, which the true prophet announces. Open our hearts to that peace as we bring our prayers before you. Almighty God, in your mercy, prayer. Let us pray for Christ's holy Catholic Church, for the leadership of our church at every level, and for all of us, in our virtual pews, worshiping this morning, that we may be true disciples, welcoming all to the way of new life that Jesus points out for us. Give us the strength and wisdom to know what is asked of us. Almighty God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, in every age, you call your people to love one another by seeking justice for all. Help us to act in our own lives, small moment by small moment, to erase the divisions among people that lead to suffering and the stifling of talent and life. Almighty God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Joyful God, once again, we celebrate the great variety of your human family with the pride celebrations that culminate this week. We give thanks for the many people who have worked to open the eyes of the world to the dignity and equality of LGBTQIA2S people. May a festival shout be heard in every heart 
that we are able to host such a celebration in our city, even virtually. Almighty God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all those who are sick or suffering in body, mind, or spirit, especially for John Gardham and Richard Harrop, for LGBTQIA2S plus people still suffering from misunderstanding, cruelty, and social isolation, for victims of all forms of violence, poverty, isolation, for all in our hearts and those whom we have forgotten. Almighty God, ease their pain, shelter and feed them. Give them confidence and serenity that you are with them. Almighty God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray for our friends and family members whom we have lost in these last days as they continue to make their journey to you. Especially, we remember Bev Hayde and the Reverend Sheila Ashworth. Compassionate one, we lift them to your loving hands. May your light perpetual shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Firm and just one, we celebrate Canada Day this week. This year, we pray especially that the great gifts of our country, the stunning beauty of this land, the vibrant diversity of its people, the traditions of democracy, equality before the law, and the protection of rights and freedoms, continue to inspire us to build and rebuild institutions that truly live up to the gifts we have been given. Almighty God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All-knowing one, we know that you hear us. We know you are with us, and for this we are ever grateful. May our prayers today be woven into the vast fabric of your kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is alive with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us into relationship. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God repasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen.